Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to our Capital Market Day. We are now presenting our strategic plan 2018-2024, and I leave the floor to our CEO, Mr. Paolo Gallo. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here, but before starting the presentation, I would like to show you our new website. It's a very short video. Uh, the website is online uh, since this morning, so exactly in, uh, in the same moment that we are presenting our new plan. Please. Good afternoon again. Uh, today I will talk you about, I will walk you through our plan. And uh, I will start with uh, the scenario presenting you, which is our view about the future of the gas in Italy and in Europe. Then uh, I will get into the strategy. Antonio then will follow giving you some numbers and the guidance for 2018 and for 2024. And finally, I will come back with the dividend policy. As you know very well, there are several packages that the European Union has issued, starting from the COP21, and then we have the EU 2020, EU 2030, and EU 2050 that are covering the various objectives that the European Union has given to all the European countries. Even more important for us is the uh, Italian uh, national strategy, energy strategy that has been issued last year that is uh, fully compliant with the European packages. I will talk later about the national energy strategy. What I wanted to show you in this chart and the following charts are the elements that are dealing with the distributors, either gas and electricity. In particular, I will talk a little bit about the decarbonization, sustainable mobility, I will have a lot of to say about the digitization, in particular of vital gas, and then I will discuss power to gas and green gas. All of that with different flavor has a different impact on the gas distributor. 
Let me say that if we talk about the gas distribution, in, uh, in this picture, the gas distribution and the gas transportation network has proven to be, in the past year, flexible in the meantime, giving security to the system and probably avoiding a huge cost that eventually consumer will bear in case somebody will decide to make everything electric. In other terms, we didn't see competition between electricity and gas and natural gas utilization. We feel that we need both of them if we want to achieve the objective that the European Union has put on all the countries. So, if we talk about the decarbonization, I think with the objective to cut the greenhouse gases emission by 80% in 2050, one of the four, one of the excellent vehicle is to use the natural gas replacing the use, the production of energy through the coal. But then we have other two powerful elements that I will discuss in a moment, that is the power to gas and the renewable gas. In other terms, natural gas is a perfect vehicle to achieve the decarbonization objective set by the European Union. Regarding the mobility, mobility is an important part. And uh, we are very pleased to say that Ital Gas not only has accepted this challenge, but has done even farther. We have already announced last year that we will go, we will change all our vehicle fleet into vehicle fleet fueled by natural gas. And we are in the process to do that. By early 2018, all our 2,500 vehicles will be fueled by natural gas. And I will show you later which is the impact both in terms of cost and in terms of lower emission. Power to gas. Somebody thinks that is a, a futuristic technology. I think it's a technology probably closer than uh, some other technology that people are thinking about uh, the storage of the electricity. Power to gas is a very powerful technology if you need uh, to storage the energy. In the old days, our grandfathers were thinking about storage the energy and the only way they, they were thinking about was pumping the water from uh, low to up in the, in the hydropower plant. And that was a safe, security, and reliable way to storage the energy. Unfortunately, this is not available anymore. All our pump storage has been exploited. Now we have an incredible technology that can be exploited to transform the energy coming from renewable or from solar, where you don't need such energy, into a perfect storage. You put the energy into the gas, producing a synthetic gas, and then you can use this the gas whenever you need any in different situations like industrial use, mobility, power generation, or eating. And finally, as, as a point <coughs> to be underlined is the biomethane. Biomethane, again, is something that is available right now is something that will uh, enhance, will enable the circular economy in the energy sector. Uh, recently, uh, the Italian uh, government has issued, the Italian authority has issued several uh, new uh, regulations about uh, the biomethane to be uh, injected into the transportation system and the uh, distribution system. Again, it's another way to use renewable energy. It's another way to reduce emission. It's another way to achieve the objective set uh, by the European Union. And it's also a way to help the local economy. The estimations are significant, 120 
billion cubic meter potential production with a significant saving for, uh, for, for, the, for the different countries. Let me, let me get into our view of the Italian outlook. Uh, last year, 2017, has been a significant year in terms of gas consumption. The amount uh, uh, that was consumed last year has been significant. We recover, uh, let me say, the loss of uh, gas consumption in the last five years. We went back to 2012 very close to the peak that was at the beginning of years 2000, that was over 80 billion cubic meters. We have tried, based on the national energy strategy, to see how the future looks like for the gas consumption. And we have developed, based on the uh, forecast of different parties, we have developed two scenarios, one low scenario and one, big, one high scenario. Of course, uh, the low scenario consider many things that should happen, like uh, a strong support for renewable penetration, like uh, massive electrification, like a significant energy efficiency. Having said that, what is, what is important to say is that uh, regarding commercial and residential usage of the natural gas, all the forecast, all the future is that that amount will remain stable over the years. And that is the, the gas that is uh, use our distribution network. Let's try to look a little bit more inside the national energy strategy. Uh, it has been the result uh, of a very uh, open, very large discussion among different stakeholders. And I think, uh, as you can see, they have uh, envisaged at least the three main areas. The first one is the national Italian strategy for energy uh, provide uh, support for the de further development of the renewable energy but also may it put a focus on the energy efficiency. And that we are very happy about that because having recently acquired an energy efficiency company, that means that our view about the evolution of the energy efficiency industry was correct, is going to play a significant role in the national energy strategy. But then, the, energy, uh, the strategy try also to close the gap in order to make our industry, all the industries, more competitive. It try to close the gap in terms of the price of the gas and the price of the energy in respect to the same price that you can find in Europe. But uh, not forgetting that uh, our country is fully dependent, is mostly dependent by foreign supply, and therefore we need to secure a different kind of supply. And again, using the gas and the electricity is not uh, trying to prefer one or the other, but is more to use both of them to achieve the very challenging objectives that uh, the national energy has set. And inside the national energy, one area has been uh, uh, one part has been devoted to the Sardinia methanization. Sardinia, as you know, is the only area in Italy, is the only region in Italy that does not have any distribution, natural gas distribution. Uh, then the strategy has envisaged nearly 1.4 billion investment regarding uh, transportation, distribution, and the uh, building of the coastal um, inventory to host uh, the LNG. Also to provide uh, fuel for vessel for, for ships. As you know, we have taken a strong position in Sardinia. We will explain to you later what we intend to do. But again, uh, to bring natural gas in Sardinia means from one side 
to replace the coal that has been, that according to the national strategy, should uh, be abandoned by 2025, and also to bring competition in Sardinia, to give the industry in Sardinia the possibility to compete with a cost of the gas lower than today is. And now I wanted just to recap about Italgas. I'm not going back uh, to the old story of Italgas like probably we did last year. But I wanted just to bring this chart uh, to give you the flavor that Italgas, and you probably know, is the indiscussed market leader in Italy. It doesn't matter from which perspective you look at. If it's the re-delivery re point, if it's volume of gas distributed, if it's uh, uh, length of the network. And then uh, this picture to me gives a very clear idea that uh, Edel Gas is uh, a competitive advantage over any other player in Italy because of the size of the network, because of the fact that we are everywhere in Italy, because we can have an advantage from the economy of scale that not all the other players may have. But you can also have a, a, a sense uh, that the, the uh, industry is still fragmented. When you see, can you go back? When you see that 22% uh, uh, of the redelivery point are owned by others, that leaves less than 1%, it is clear that there are too many, there are still too many players, even though we have been uh, reducing significantly the numbers of operator. Still, they are too many. And they are too many, not because uh, we like uh, monopoly situation, but uh, if uh, the consolidation will take place, uh, the advantage for the industry is significant. It's an advantage for the industry. It's an advantage for the investment. It's an advantage for the final customer. As you know, the recognition of the OPEX today is linked to the size of the company. If the, you have a small company, you receive more euro per each single PD uh, redelivery point that you manage. If you are large, you receive less. So only the consolidation will bring advantage, and I'm just talking about economic advantage to the final customer. This consolidation should happen through tenders. And unfortunately, the tenders are not happening at the pace that we expected to happen. We try to project uh, our view in three different moments. November 2016, May, 2000 and May June 2017, and today. I don't know if we have been uh, too much optimistic in the past. Uh, I don't know if we have been too much conservative today. That is our view. And that is uh, the view that we used to develop our strategic plan. We see 2023 as, so six years from now, the year in which all the tender, according to us and according to the current situation, will be, uh, will be terminated, will be finished. And in fact, uh, in our plan, 2024 is the last year in which tenders are fully deployed. But uh, on the other end, we are fortunate to live in a an environment in a regulatory framework that is very stable and there's a clear visibility about the future. As you know from uh, 
beginning of October last year until the end of September is the period in which uh, the uh, counter risk premium, it's under, uh, it's under analysis and will be reviewed in the last quarter of 2018. Some other elements will be reviewed, such as the tax rate and the inflation rate. We've all, we, the situation as of today, we feel and we expect that the weighted average cost of capital will remain the same during the plan period, so until both for distribution and for metering. Now, let's get to the strategy. Let's get more in details about the industrial plan. The first point that I would like to talk to you is the sustainability plan that we have recently developed and just in December of last year, the Borough of Director has approved. We have identified nine of the, four, of the 17 sustainable goals. And around these nine goals, we have developed five pillars. Five pillars, 14 goals to achieve, and 43 sustainability action to be achieved in the 2018-2019 period. Which are the pillars? The first one is probably general, it would be probably normal, commitment to sustainability. We want to, we want that ethyl gas as more visibility about the sustainability. We want the culture of sustainability become part of our culture. And then the second pillar relates to the person, to the people that are working in ethyl gas. We want to focus on them, and you will understand why later. Uh, we want to focus on them. We want to protect the competence. We want to enhance the know-how. We want to put uh, let me say, the center of our attention to our person. Not only I want to recall you our effort about safety. In the last uh, 18 months, we have been spent uh, hours and hours in order to promote the safety culture, increase the safety culture in our company. And then we know how it is important, uh, the relationship with the local community. Uh, how it is important to have a good relationship and how it is important that the local community see Italgas as a company that is providing good services, that is providing what is necessary for a, for a good life. Same attention we have we need to have for our customer, not only the sales company, but also we want to recover the relationship with the end customer. And finally, we go back to the energy efficiency. Uh, in a sense that as we have seen in the national strategy, energy efficiency is, is the center in the national strategy. And we want to use all our, all our possibility to enhance reducing, to enhance the efficiency, reducing the carbon footprint, developing new idea about uh, reducing energy consumption. Then I'm getting into the industrial part, but uh, every time uh, of, the, of the goals and the objective that I will explain to you, I will try to link the sustainability to what we have written in our industrial plan. Our growth is coming mainly from uh, organic capex and from M&A. And then we have, uh, and we will spend more time later, we have put a significant effort about innovation and digitization of the, of the network and the processes. Of course, we cannot forget the operational efficiency. We have been very good last year in achieving uh, the target that uh, 
we set for 2018, but we will continue to work on the operational efficiency in order to always outperform the level of efficiency that the regulator every year, year by year, put on us. And then the gas tender. We just talk about the time frame of the gas tender as uh, the tool also to consolidate the sector is also an incredible opportunity for us to invest at RAV value. And I should say that we can do all that, and we can do all the numbers that we will show you in a moment, because in the last 15 months, we have been able to completely uh, rebuild the financial structure of the company. Today, we have, and Antonio will give you details, 88% 88 of the debt at fixed rate. We have a very low cost. And we have also the possibility to use the flexibility of our balance sheet to further grow. And finally, we cannot forget, of course, our shareholders. And we will talk about our dividend policy, our review dividend policy. We want to share with our shareholder any upside we are able to create year by year in our day by day management. CAPEX, 4 billion euro in the next uh, seven years. And this is nothing to do with tenders. And I think that's the, the good part of the, the nice part of the, of the plan. Uh, 4 billion, it's all in our end. We don't have to rely on a municipality to launch the tender is something that we can deploy quite easily and we can achieve as we did in the last, last year. Two billion are devoted to the network, 800 million to the, I would say, innovation and digitization of the grid. And then you, you can say we have allocated uh, 450 million to the development of the Sardinia methanization is both acquisition and capex, and also a similar number to the M&A, where the major amount is in acquisition, and there's still also some capex that the new acquisition will bring. And finally, we have devoted 300 million to the, the so-called centralized asset, mainly real estate, I'm going back to the sustainability. We will uh, refurbish some of our buildings where our people are living. We want to provide to our person a better environment. They spend uh, most of their life with us and, and therefore they should be happy and they should work in a very um, friendly and nice environment. And then of course the other area of the centralized asset is the expenditure for the ICT, for the movement from the traditional infrastructure to, to cloud. I will talk later about that. I'm going immediately to the result and then I will look into each single components of the investment. With four billion investment, our, our RAB will grow from uh, a little bit less than 6 billion euro to 7.3 billion euro at the end of the plan. Again, with no consideration about tenders. So the, the increase is significant, is remarkable. 3.2% per year is a very interesting and important number. Now, let's see the different factor, the different element of our investment uh, story. Two billion for the network. One of the, one of our, let me say, core business is to maintain the network, to extend the network, to operate the network in, with safety and security. In that case, we have uh, 
new grades that has to be completed in south of Italy, thanks to the new acquisition. There are extensions requested by the municipality. Uh, there is the replacement of the old uh, pipes that will be completed by, next, by the end of next year. And then we will continue to replace the um, cast iron in order to be completed by, let me say, the end of the plan. In the meantime, you have to think that in 2021, some of the old pipes uh, will be completely uh, depreciated, and we have set uh, a pace of 250 kilometers per year to be replaced. We are in the process to connect the existing LPG network to our, ex to our national network, so moving from the LPG to natural gas. And again, there is a big attention about the energy efficiency and sustainability. Turbine expander and cogen plant set uh, established in our network will help us to reduce the emission and to be more efficient in the use of the energy. Just an anticipation about uh, the metering and the digita digitization of the grid, 800 million, 500 to complete the replacement of the, of the meters. Uh, last year, we had 800 million. Uh, of course, one year, as the 2000, in 2017, we installed nearly 1.7 million smart meters, so it's natural that this number is going to be reduced. In the meantime, we have allocated 300 million for asset digitization mainly, but also for the digital factory. I will talk about both of them in a minute. Other opportunities, M&A. I think we have shown in 2017 our ability to securing a number of M&A transactions. We will continue to do that. So we will, as you remember last year, we said that we will do M&A in 1718. You will see that we have extended the program um, in order to acquire other small operator. We will do that uh, as we did in the past uh, with a strict financial discipline. And then we have the Sardinia. We will talk about uh, more in detail uh, the acquisition that we made has opened up the window to make a significant investment in Sardinia, again, at the right value. We do not want to forget the energy efficiency uh, we recently acquired an energy efficiency company. We feel that we made a very good step in entering a business that is very close to our main business. And in fact, the energy efficiency business has a lot of similarity with the gas distribution. Highly fragmented industry, high potential, and we want to play a significant role. And last but not least, uh, there are the opportunity to consolidate some of our affiliates. Maybe you have heard and you have read some rumors on the newspaper about Toscan Energia. And we hope that uh, uh, we will be able in the, in the months to come to consolidate uh, that company. Coming back to the M&A, that is the picture that uh, represent the 2017 achievement. I don't want to get into detail, but I want just to underline the fact that we have been able to secure six transactions, plus one on the energy efficiency. Out of the six, one was completed in 17. The remaining five plus one were completed in the first semester of 18.
So we, as, we, as I said before, we feel there's still a room to increase our M&A. So the 1718 was what we said one year ago. We said we want to acquire 200,000 re-delivery points for 200 million. We are going to acquire a, a ton, um, 180, thousand redelivery point and this expenditure will be probably close to roughly to 300 million and then we have set another goal for 2019 and additionally 70,000 and uh, to uh, increase uh, our growth so that is our objective and I think you can uh, it's not hard to believe that we will able to deliver what we have promised, considering what we have been able to do in only 12 months. I'm referring to the 17. Let me just talk a little bit more about Sardinia. Why I'm talking about Sardinia is because uh, Italgas has uh, achieved also in Sardinia a significant role a major role in the methanization program. As you know, we have acquired about one third of the concession of the old Sardinia. We have acquired a company that is in operation, that is the one in Sassari. And what we are in uh, implementing is a CAPEX plan that will make Sardinia probably the most advanced area in terms of gas distribution network technology. Why? Because we are going to build that. So we are going to put all the smart meters, of course, but all the sensor along the, the network in order to make a, a true digitized grid. And then we will not use the LPG. We will, uh, the new concession that we are going to put in operation will immediately start with LNG. And uh, most of the basin will be connected one to each other in order to reduce the number of LNG tank from one side, increase the security of all the basin. And that is the, our, uh, our plan. So today we have not a lot of clients, less than 15,000, but the potential is, is significant. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to our ability to invest at RAP. On the energy efficiency side, uh, as, uh, as I told before, as I said before, this is an opportunity for us. I think uh, we have done uh, a good selection. I mean, it took us nearly one year to select uh, the company. We are very happy with the selection we made uh, because we found a company that was able not only to develop wide certificate, but also to develop uh, a competence in fields of big data, machine learning, business intelligence that is uh, putting with what you are going to see in few moments about our digital program is going to be a perfect fit. And we feel that starting from uh, Seaside, we can build also a very successful story about the energy efficiency. Now, let me get into what I like most, our digital program. Today, when you listen to anybody talking, uh, everybody will talk about digital, going digital. I think, I don't know about the other, I think what for us is not only talking, but is making things happening. And we have said our digital program refers to three areas, assets, processes, and workforce. On the assets, I will show you some example in a few minutes. Our idea 
is to complete the smart meter installation, but this, this is the only, this is the first step, is just the beginning of the long journey. We want to put around our grid a number of sensors that will be able, or like we call IoT devices, because we want to get as much data as possible from the, from the network in order that through machine learning, through other algorithms that we will we'll develop, we will be able to manage in a different way our grid. The second area regards the processes. And here, the digital factory will play a significant role. But I will come back to the, with the digital factory. The idea is to, from one side, simplify the processes. And when the process has been simplified, to make it digital. Using, you see some, some example, advanced analytics, machine learning, bots, maybe introducing the blockchain technology on some specific processes. But the idea is really to change the culture of the company, making this company real a digital company. And the third area is the workforce. Today, our operators are already going around with iPad. We want to make a big step forward. We want to make uh, our operator be able to use uh, what is called mixed or augmented reality in order that they can receive an help from a remote, they can receive instruction, they can receive support, they can use uh, three data available in terms of maps, they can see where the spare parts are located if they need it, and on top of that, they can operate in a more safety situation. And we can help them in remote to do, to operate in such a secure mode. Not only, but remotely we can control the work that will be performed on ground. In order to do that, uh, we need to have uh, an evolution of our IT infrastructure. And when I'm saying we are doing the things. We are not just talking about digital. We are just making digital a reality in our company. We, have, uh, we are in the process to move into the cloud-based model. And uh, we will use the digital factory as the real engine, is the true engine that will make our company different from the other. On the asset. As I said, the first step is complete the installation of the smart meters. We are in the process to do that. We confirmed the plan that we have announced last year. By early 2020, all our meters will be smart. We will outperform the regulatory minimum level of 50%. Uh, the pace is 1.6 million. Uh, smart meters replace every year. It will continue in 18, 19, and early 2020 will be completed. Many times when I met investors, they are, they are asking me, which are the benefits of installing the smart meters, especially UK investors? They don't really believe in the benefit of the smart meters. So that's the reason why, instead of just talking, we put these... Uh, page to illustrate which are the benefits that are not only for the distributors, are for the sales company, are for the customers, are for the system. For the distributor, I don't want to go through one by one, but it is evident, as I said before, smart meters is the first step to digitize the grid. Without the smart meters, the digitization of the grid will never happen. For the sales company, they can receive the, every day the consumption. They can make more accurate invoices. 
And on the other side, the customer, we receive more accurate invoices. The gas consumption is not uh, stable over the months of the year. Varies very much from the winter to the, to the summer. And today, we have the obligation to read, I think, one or twice, depending on the size of the, of the customer, the uh, smart, the meters. So customer will be able to receive more accurate invoice. And in the meantime, will be able eventually to become smart in the gas consumption. If he's able to read what he's consuming on a real-time basis, he will be able to make a decision about energy efficiency or less consumption. So making aware the final customer about its consumption it's the only way to make it aware of the efficiency it can gain, not only in terms of energy consumption, but also from an economic point of view. This is what we intend to do when we say we will uh, put along the grid a number of sensors to collect as much data as possible in order to move to real-time monitoring, leak detection, predictive maintenance. That is our objective. But if we will not complete the digitization of the grid, we will never be able to do that. So that's the reason why we are accelerating and replacing smart meters from one side, but also the other sensor along the grid. And that's an example. We have, uh, again, we are not just, we are not talking only. We are making things happen. In that case, uh, it's one pilot that is uh, current under, let's say, upgrading. It's one of the 42 pilots. And you can see the difference between uh, a very simple grid on your uh, right and a very digitize a real digitized grid on your no on, your, on the left on the right okay but it's easy to understand uh, when we will complete uh, the all the 42 pilots and get all the data we will move to all i mean to the complete network it will take uh, it will take us few years but uh, in three or four years' time, we will be able to have all our grid in Italy digitized. Let's move to the processes. Digital program. What we have, what we have done up to now. 17, it has been the first step in which we <clears throat> separate digital gas application from the SNAM one, still hosted in the Green Data Center. In these weeks, we are moving from the green data center into cloud platform. By the, by the end of the year, all our application will be on cloud. It has been a significant effort. It's still a significant effort. But our objective is to complete that transformation, that migration by before the end of the year. Once that we will complete that migration, we will launch the digital factory. And I will explain to you what digital factory means for us. Our chief information officer that is playing a very nice job has put this program, very detailed program. You can say we start implementing Salesforce on our call center. We will move Salesforce and use Salesforce for, also for our emergency situation. And then you have, I mean, a very detailed program. I think using, uh, as, as you see, infrastructure, platform, and software as a services. I think, and I don't want to get into details, I think that once the cloud will the migration to cloud will be completed, this program will be much faster. So one year from now, I will show you this chart and the new chart, and you will see the acceleration and the speed 
after cloud migration will be completed. Digital factory. Digital factory for us is a true factory. Uh, we will move from the old, old ways. I remember when the people were writing the blueprint. Months and months to write a blueprint identifying all the needs. And then this big book was moving to the IT guys. I don't know what were they were making. And then they called the, the provider, other, other third party company. And after maybe one year and a half, you would receive something that say, but I have asked something different. Yes, but we were not able to do it. So time, cost, and you would never have the right thing. It's not going to happen anymore. I mean, digital factory is exactly the response to that. It will be done in weeks. It will be done in a cost limited, cost assigned, budget assigned. It will work or not, and eventually it will be redone. And it should meet perfectly the request of the internal customer. Why? Because in that room, there will be all the people. Nobody will missing from IT, business, operation, administrative, project control. Everybody will be around the table. And we will use the new technology that are available like agile, design thinking. And we will deliver a few weeks what is called minimal viable product. Operation people, if everybody will be happy, will see immediately what they have requested. And that would be an incredible engine to change the culture of the company. We should not forget the operational efficiency. We have been able very, we have been very good last year. As you know, we are able to achieve the objective that was set at the end of 2018 with one year in advance. We will continue to do that. Uh, of course, you cannot expect that every year we will cut the cost by 15%. It's impossible. But our objective is outperform year by year the efficiency set by the regulator. Some of the activities have been already completed. Some other are in progress. Some other will come. I will give you a few examples of new activity. Make or, make or buy. I mean, it's a very old fashioned way. But still, for us, it's very important. Why? Because with the reorganization of the operation, we, we have decided that at least 90% of the, of the emergency, emergency response unit activity should be carried out by our personnel. Safety and security is the most important things for our job. And that's the reason why we want to keep that activity inside. Based on that, that will give us the dimension in terms of number of people, we will move in identifying other activities to be allocated inside, considering also the fact that we have an average age for the personnel that uh, is, uh, is quite high. So we will see in the years to come many people leaving for uh, retirement. And we want to bring the competence. In the meantime, we want to bring new people with new competence especially in, digital, in the digital side. Again, our idea is to maintain the high value added activities inside the company and uh, releasing what we call low added value activities. We want to keep the competence inside the company. Remember when in the sustainability plan we said the second pillar was relevant to the personnel. That's another element to uh, adhere to the uh, one of our principle in the sustainability. Another example, corporate restructuring. It's a never ending process, uh, I would say, especially in view of all the M&A activity that we are carrying. Uh, we have uh, 
completed the incorporation of uh, Napoletana gas. We have done ACAM gas in Enerco just recently. We want to move the affiliates uh, directly under Italgaspa in order to facilitate the flow of the dividends from the operating company to the holding company. We have kept uh, Italgas Aqua and Seaside uh, separate companies in order to optimize the management of our different businesses. We will continue to simplify our corporate structure with the aim to reduce cost and be more efficient every day. I've talked about uh, mobility, I've talked about uh, sustainability before. As I said, by early 2018, uh, all our fleet will be uh, natural gas fueled. It's a matter of saving cost, minus 50%. It's a matter of reducing significant the amount of emission, especially on the particulate. We are working in urban area, and therefore the reduction of such emission is critical. We are able, in in that way to demonstrate that there is an immediate solution to the problem of the pollution of our city is convert the vehicles from diesel of, of fuel into or the diesel or gasoline into, into natural gas. Those numbers clearly uh, underline the fact that uh, if you are committed to sustainability, you can do it, and you can do it in a very short period of time. Those uh, uh, cars, those uh, made by uh, Fiat Chrysler Automobile, are available now. We should not wait years, and any experiment are available now, and we can bring uh, emission reduction immediately in our, in our city. Another example, procurement strategy is still a process going on. I will probably only point it out. Some of them have, you have already seen in the past. I, I would like to point it out just uh, that we will try to reduce our warehouse. We will try to optimize our logistic flow with the aim to reduce spare parts from one side, but from the other side also to make them available immediately when it is needed. And finally, the result of this efficiency program is that we will be able to continuously reduce our baseline cost outperforming the regulator efficiency level. Let's talk about the tenders a little bit. You, we, you have already seen those charts in the past. Uh, <clears throat> those are our criteria. We will select the items uh, in, in according to those criteria are the same criteria that we have uh, um, described last year. Nothing has changed. Unfortunately, we cannot announce many tenders to be uh, already completed, but still our strategy is there, is, uh, is, the, is the same one. With such strategy, we confirm our, uh, our view in the, in the tenders in a sense that we have divided the items into three clusters. The first cluster here is the cluster where we, we feel we have a very nice position. And uh, uh, in those cluster, in that cluster, we would like to win all, most of them, if not all of the tenders. In the second cluster, we feel that our competitive position is uh, a little bit weaker, uh, and we intend to win around 40% of those items. In, in the third cluster, we are not interested to participate, and we will cash in the um, redemption value. If you make up the numbers, you will come to 8.5 million redelivery point at the end of the uh, of, at the end of the plan. We have divided this plan into step. The step that show the increase 
of the redelivery point through organic investment and M&A, and the, the step that from that point will bring to the 40% market share. All those number does not include, I'm underlining this point, does not include our affiliates. To reach that uh, final goal, we will invest 1.6 million, 1.6 billion euro. 1.1 is the net capital to acquire the new concession, net meaning gross minus the redemption value of the uh, item that we are going to lose. And uh, the new concession will uh, create additional capex need of 0 0.5 billion to upgrade those concessions, to bring those concessions at the same technological level of our existing grid. The RAB, based on that evolution, will move from a little bit less than 6 billion today to more than 8, I think it's around 8.4 8 billion at the end of the plan. Again, we have shown you the evolution of the RAB through the organic investment and the M&A, and then through the tenders. To make all that plan happen, the overall capex allocated is 5.6 billion, four for organic and M&A, and 1.6 for tenders. As we said, tender represent an additional opportunity to employ capital at RAB. I will give the floor to Antonio that will discuss with you some numbers about financial and economics. Thank you. Antonio. Thank you, Paolo, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The intention now is to go uh, to walk through the following few slides in order to uh, comment together the evolution of our financials in order to comment together the uh, solidity and efficiencies of our balance sheet, and um, let me say in, in a nutshell how we are convinced that our job has created the conditions for sustaining the growth, that uh, the growth opportunity that Paolo has just described, creating uh, value for our shareholders, which in our mind mean, means uh, to maintain our cost of capital below the uh, return we are in a position to extract from our asset and at the same time to maintain the same quality of our balance sheet we have today. Uh, I would start underlying the uh, cash flow generation of, uh, of our company, our group. Uh, we can count on a, a cash flow generation which is around 10% of RAB. We expect every year an FFO to RAB of around 10%, which is uh, uh, so significant not, not only for the level but also for the stability of this number throughout uh, the entire plan period. Uh, we are committed to, to maintain the uh, metrics we have uh, uh, in relation to the uh, ratings at the same level we have today and therefore also the um, Andron committed the credit lines. We, today, today we have around 1 billion of uh, banking facilities not used, but which are important for reducing the risk perceived by the rating agency and therefore to maintain the current, the current, uh, the current situation. Uh, in relation to our cost of debt, which uh, I believe uh, uh, put us in the, um, among the, uh, the best in class, Currently, we uh, have a cost of around 1% now. We expect our cost of debt to increase due to the refinancing exercise we will do in the, the, uh, in the, in the period uh, to around 1.4% at the end of the plan. Uh, but it's important to say that with these very few costs, uh, we are paying a, a very solid debt structure. We have an exposure to interest rates limited to around 12%. 88% of our fixed rate is 
our, our debt is at fixed rate and uh, with a, a, a very long duration, we're talking about seven years, and we do not have, uh, we will not have any refinancing uh, needs, so refinancing of um, funding, so bonds uh, uh, going to maturities until 2022. Uh, this uh, is uh, a slide which, in our mind, uh, uh, gives you immediately the uh, structure of the uh, financial model of the group. Uh, we are in the position to finance all the growth and the dividends and then M&A. This is the news of this, of, this, of this plan with our operating cash flow. Uh, we expect... Uh, uh, to be in a position to uh, arrive at the end of this, of this plan uh, before the tenders uh, with the same uh, level of, 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 of debt. Uh, so all the financial flexibility is, uh, is, is available for capturing uh, the advantage we, 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 we expect from the tenders and uh, to enhance our shareholders' remuneration in case uh, this uh, will be the benefit for all. The um, following slide is uh, related uh, to the uh, key credit metrics. In, uh, it's, it's, it's clear that we will maintain uh, both our leverage and uh, our FFO to net debt, which are the most important ratios used in our business from the credit agencies, uh, well, uh, well uh, uh, I would say better than the one requested for our ratings. Um, we uh, will maintain our leverage below 65%, well below 65%, and uh, the cash flow generation to net debt uh, at 15% uh, and, and, and more. Uh, the um, uh, element I just want to underline is that due to the anticipation of the capital deployment uh, we expect, uh, we have built uh, with the MNA and the Sardinia project, we expect to reach the, the, the peak of our leverage between uh, 18 and 19. And uh, in this case, the, the peak means uh, around 63%. After that, even with the tenders, we expect to have uh, our balance sheet, uh, um, our leverage remaining uh, or decreasing in the remaining at the same level or decreasing in the second part of the of the plan. Those are the result of our job for 18, for 17 and 18. We are very proud of, of that. Uh, first of all, uh, we have concluded the uh, disintermediation of our uh, financing, disintermediation this, this from the, the banking system. Uh, our colleagues of the banking, we are, I believe, are, we cannot be so happy, but for us, is important to have maximized the, the, uh, the funds, the, the, the financing from the most efficient market, the capital market in our case, uh, which today represents 79% of the total debt, and uh, the, uh, the support from the European Investment Bank, uh, which today represents 21% of the whole. Uh, in terms of maturity, we, have, uh, we will have uh, um, the uh, funds uh, granted by the European Investment Bank for around, uh, uh, around 20 years. Uh, if I remember well, the uh, maturities are between uh, 30, 2032 and 2037, so very, uh, very, 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 very far. And uh, we have distributed the maturities of the bonds, uh, I was uh, saying before, not having uh, a refinancing exercise between uh, 2022. In uh, terms of uh, uh, um, for, for, the, for the credit agencies, on top of the outstanding debt, uh, we do have the uh, banking facilities not used by, but available and committed in the medium term uh, at around one point, for, for an amount of around 1.1 billion euros, uh, which also permit us to manage the working capital. In terms of uh, uh, fixed floating, uh, I have just commented, 
this is uh, uh, something, uh, uh, the, the, the ratio is uh, a bit uh, higher than the target we have uh, discussed last year, the, the, the two-third fixed rate, one-third floating rate, but uh, last year we decided at the end uh, to capture the advantage which the financial markets presented, uh, and uh, today we can we can we are proud to have a portfolio of bonds with a average coupon of around 1.2 percent for seven years of tenor uh, which is something that uh, we believe will protect our own performance uh, in uh, in the long run now i just uh, uh, this is one of the most important slides for for for, for our friends of the analyst that we uh, would uh, give you some guidance for 18 and uh, some outlook for in the, long, in the long term. Revenues, we expect for this year an amount of around 1.2 billion or so revenues uh, for the distribution activities uh, regulated and for the ancillary services. Uh, an EBDA between 810 and 830, so we are close to 70% uh, uh, ratio between ABDI and revenues. Um, the EBIT to RAB uh, is uh, will 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 be uh, will be higher than seven percent. And as far as the capex are concerned, uh, we expect to have uh, a, cap a capital deployment of around seven hundred million euros, of which two hundred million for the M and A exercise and five hundred million for the capex for the capex, uh, for, for the invest, technical investment. Uh, at the end of this year, we uh, expect, we estimate a consolidated rub of 6.2 billion euros, of which around 200 from an M&A, from the asset we intend uh, to buy with the M&A activities, uh, with a leverage of 63%. In the long run, for the long run, at the ABDA, we expect an ABDA uh, uh, first of all, those are numbers without any uh, 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 hypothesis of, of consolidation of, uh, of some affiliates, uh, we, which today we do not consolidate, Tosca Energy in other words. Uh, the ABDA we expect at the end of this plan is 1.1 billion. Uh, we uh, expect uh, uh, to have uh, around uh, six uh, 5.6 million of investment and the rub, which has been uh, already anticipated by Paolo at the end of the period of around 8.1 uh, billion euros. The leverage uh, is uh, expected to be below the current, uh, the current level, below 60%. Now I would uh, ask Paolo to comment the, the most important part, and anyway, the final and the most important part of the presentation. Thank you, Antonio. Um, so I'm going to finish the presentation, and then I will open the, the floor to any question you may have. Just to recap some of the major, what we feel being the major point of the strategic plan. The first one is that we are able to invest in the next seven years 4 billion euro. As I said before, all in our end is not linked to any municipality, any tenders to be approved by the regulator, any tenders to be awarded. And I think it's, it's a very strong message that we want to give to the, the market. The second point is, in my presentation, digital transformation of the company is our core and major goal. That it's a big challenge. It will see ourselves engaged for the next three years at minimum. It's going to be tough, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be a simple journey. We are just at the beginning. Uh, as I said before, cloud, for example, is just the beginning of the journey. But I think that the results will be incredible. Uh, and most of that will be probably the only one in Italy and one of the few in Europe in the world. Uh, 
tenders, we still waited the tender for consolidation and for the opportunity. Hopefully it will arrive sooner or later. And uh, as, as Antonio said, our balance sheet, and we need to thank you all the all the persons that are working with Antonio because they have done an incredible job to refinance what the analysts did not believe back, if you remember, back in November 16, where didn't believe we were able to finance at such lower cost the, the bridge to bond. So we will go to the last slide. That is our review of the dividends. Um, is the second review we made, uh, if you remember, in November 16, we promised a low single digit dividend increase. Then we moved to 4% last year. Now we say 4% is still there, but we want to give any upside to our shareholder, recognize to them, and it will be again in our end, the ability to being to deliver a higher result. So we will pay a dividend per share that should be equal to 60% of the consolidated net income. We feel that's a very good, very nice proposition because we feel confident that year by year we will do better than 4% as an increase of dividend per share. Um, then it's up to our shareholder investor to believe it or not. We will demonstrate it at the end of this year. Thank you very much for your attention. So let's uh, go ahead uh, in this way. We will start uh, taking the question from the floor, then uh, we will move uh, to the uh, streaming uh, and uh, eventually some uh, questions from the website. Okay, from the floor, we start from uh, Javier. Javier, Javier Soreta, Medibanca, thank you for, uh, for taking my questions. Um, on slide 40, 43, uh, when you are mentioning the, uh, the cost base of the company, uh, obviously uh, the company has been very successful reducing the, the cost base in 2017. Uh, it seems that the, that the line indicates a reduction in the cost base versus in 2024 versus 2017 and that is excluding uh, the tendering process. So if you can give us a little bit of more light on the capacity of the company of continuing reducing the cost base, X uh, tenders. And also maybe a, a related question is on the, on the EBITDA margin. So I think that the, uh, that the CFO during the presentation has mentioned, on, uh, has mentioned the, the EBITDA margin is at 70%. I was just wondering if you can give us light on where do you see the EBITDA margin by 2024, including the tenders? That is the first question. Second question is on uh, slide 40, 49. Um, you are mentioning that there is financial flexibility uh, within, uh, within your balance set. Uh, you are mentioning the possibility to enhance shareholder remuneration. So when you are thinking about that 60% uh, net debt to total, uh, to total wrap, what is the logic behind, or uh, putting uh, the question in different terms, what do you think that is the optimal capital structure for a company like Italgas? Uh, if you can be more specific on the financial flexibility that you see within, within the company. And then uh, in, on slide uh, 27 on the M&A activity, um, I think we were just uh, mentioning uh, uh, um, that the spending uh, that you are uh, putting on, the, on that slide is lower than the, than the wrap, so uh, kind of indicates that you, do you see the opportunity of continue implementing M&A opportunities paying even below the wrap value of the asset. Do you think that that is uh, a conservative assumption or why the companies feel so comfortable that they can continue buying an asset below wrap values? Thank you. I will respond to you for the first and the last question, and I will let Antonio develop the, the, the other two in between. Let me start with the last one. We have paid either the RAB 
or a small premium over the rub. So I don't see where we are paying an enterprise value lower than the wrap. Uh, if you take pa page 27, um, you, or even the 26, the previous one, you will see that the enterprise value that we pay for the first six, seven acquisition was 150 million when, and the rub was 120. Uh, it looks like a very high, high premium in the case, but out of 150, you should take out what we pay for Seaside, that is not, of course, that has nothing to do with RAB, around 9 million, and uh, what we pay for Medea retail activity, that, of course, has nothing to do with the RAB. If you take out those numbers, you are right to uh, 137 million versus 120 million of RAB. Uh, and then uh, what the estimation was uh, on the M&A not yet identified. Of course, we have negotiation going on, but of course we cannot disclose any names. We have just compared, uh, we have just said the number of redelivery points and our estimation of RAB for those points. As we said before, as I said before, we will continue the uh, financial discipline and stay and pay RAB or a, pre or a small premium to RAB. We are not willing to pay a huge premium on RAB. So that is the, our position. Uh, regarding cost saving, cost saving refers to the, <clears throat> refers to the same perimeter. Of course, we need to compare uh, apple with apple, we cannot put apple with orange, otherwise we will never understand uh, the comparison. So after 2018, through the action that I, some of them I have illustrated before, we should be able to reduce by 2-3% per year our cost base. The tender represents, uh, from that point of view, an opportunity. Why? Because uh, uh, there is, from one side, an opportunity. From the other side, uh, uh, not really an opportunity. From, the opportunity is that we acquire additional, uh, additional redelivery point with the same uh, organization. So if you look at the KPI defined by uh, Euro per redelivery point as a cost, you will see that the, uh, that the number will decrease year by year. All from because we are going to reduce the cost, but also the number of uh, redelivery points will increase. And uh, the acquisition of fruit tenders will improve that uh, trend. Uh, you should also uh, consider, and we said last year, uh, and we confirmed that, that we see an increase of concession fee, even if it's not huge, but we see some increase of the concession fee once the tender will be completed. So the concession fee today we pay around 55 million euro will increase up to nearly 100 million euro at the end of the plan uh, because of the new perimeter, of course, larger perimeter, but also because the new concession, with the new acquisition will have slightly higher concession in respect of today's concession. EBITDA in financial. Funziona? Does it work? Okay. For the EBDA, uh, it is clear that uh, we expect, it's clear, it's, we expect it to increase. Today we have uh, a level of around 70%. Uh, due to the same elements that Paolo was discussing before, uh, we expect to win this, uh, uh, this, this in this situation. We expect uh, to have our operating cost decreasing for both the larger uh, number of uh, PDA uh, redelivery points and anyway the lower total cost. We uh, expect uh, uh, to have this mitigated uh, by the uh, additional cost of the concession fees, but all, all in all, uh, we expect a significant increase. Uh, the uh, number we gave in the guideline uh, represent more than 70% of the, 
of, of the revenues. As far as the um, best balance sheet, I mean, the best, the, what we consider the best leverage, I would say that uh, it's something around the, 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 the range of 60, 65%, and I would just to, to give you uh, the reason of that. Uh, we believe it is the best combination between uh, uh, the uh, two necessities we have, reducing our cost of capital, but at the same time not jeopardizing the risk related to our company, our group. Uh, I would say that today is in this range, today because today we have in front of us significant opportunity of growth. When you have in your business, in your country, uh, such significant growth opportunities that we have just mentioned, I repeat, 3.2% are in our hands because our capex, organic capex, and the M&A. The other 2% is something that depends on the, the tenders, but I mean, I believe that when you have this such significant opportunity, uh, it's a good thing to maintain the flexibility of your balance sheet for sustaining the, them. Stefano Gaberini. Good afternoon, Stefano Gamberini, Equita Sim. Four questions, if I may. First of all, regarding uh, the acquisitions, uh, you have this target, uh, 100 million euros more uh, compared to the previous one, uh, around 70 red delivery points of additional acquisitions. Uh, could you give us uh, an idea of w what is uh, the uh, total potential acquisitions that you see in the market, uh, and if uh, uh, these acquisitions uh, or this potential acquisition could uh, even increase considering the postponement of the tenders or not. Uh, the second regarding uh, the reasons uh, uh, that are uh, pushing uh, postponement in the, in the tenders and what could be, in your view, the solution in order to accelerate this, this trend uh, and not to see a uh, further postponement in the forthcoming years. The third, uh, regarding uh, the uh, Toscana Energia, could you elaborate a little bit uh, more about uh, this possible acquisition of the, of the control? They the were in, on the press in the past days, uh, the fact that on at the end of June there should be an important shareholder meeting uh, for the uh, governance of the company and uh, what could be the opportunity that you can uh, have on, on this uh, uh, subsidiary. The third, uh, regarding uh, the EPS, you gave us uh, a clear picture regarding the, 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 the growth of RAP and the EBDA and uh, a clear uh, dividend policy. So, uh, if I can elaborate a little bit more, we can also extrapolate that the dividend policy could be sustainable also for the forthcoming uh, the, the, the years after 2020. And so if you can help us uh, uh, to understand what could be the EPS growth uh, uh, in your plan. Thanks. OK. Uh, regarding the, the M&A, I think we, we said in the past that we have made uh, a a general survey about uh, the uh, potential operators, small operators that can be, that can, we can acquire, uh, potentially, because of course uh, the, the operator is, should be uh, willing to sell to us. We have identified at the time, at the beginning of the research, about around the 1 billion, well, 1 billion, 1 million, Redelivery point, um, and uh, uh, up to now, uh, the, all the operators that uh, we have been in contact with, uh, except few of them, they have shown their ability, their their willingness to to sell. Is going to continue for the time being. We have added another seventy thousand uh, uh, redelivery point to be acquired during two thousand and nineteen. Uh, we feel that uh, if the tenders will be further delayed, there will be other opportunity. 
because the small operator are just waiting the tender to sell. If the tenders will not come, they will find uh, uh, another way. So they will find uh, some operator like us that are willing to buy. Uh, of course, if the tenders will stay, as we have uh, described before in terms of time frame, we feel that uh, the opportunity in the M&A starting from 2020 will significantly be reduced. Uh, again, tenders and opportunity for M&A are if the tenders are going well, opportunity for M&A will be low. If the tenders are delayed, the opportunities for M&A will be available. Uh, why the tenders are delayed? Uh, it's it's not a should not is not a political reason. As I said many times, uh, is the fact that the uh, most of the municipality are not equipped with the right competence and also with the right uh, um, effort to um, issue the tender, to evaluate the tender, and to assign the tender. You, you should also consider that uh, with no tender assignment, the life is going on as, as it is now. So the citizen will continue to receive a good service, will continue to receive the natural gas. So from a customer point of view, there is no um, bad, um, bad situation, even if the tender are not assigned. And that is an element for which uh, uh, you should consider as the reason why municipality, they are not so keen to bring the tender to the, to the point uh, to be awarded. What, what should we do? We said already in the past that uh, there are the, uh, either the Regione and the um, Ministro, uh, Ministro del Sviluppo Economico has, have the right to replace the municipality and issue the tender. Uh, regarding uh, with the actual regulation that and legislation, that's the only way in which a third party like the regione or Mr. Sviluppo Economico, Mr. Sviluppo Economico, may take the action. Regarding Toscana Energia, you have read on the newspaper uh, by the end of June there will be an extraordinary shareholder meeting that should approve the new. Uh, uh, the new article of association that should allow uh, the uh, private, like us, to take uh, the uh, majority. From a, from a governance point of view, we will not see any changes. Why I'm saying that? Because today we as Italgas, we have the right to appoint the um, chief operating o chief executive officer. We will continue to have that right. Um, Toscana Energia, uh, I mean, it's a very nice company. is running has been running very well. Very good result. We don't want to change anything. The only significant change is the fact that if the if and I'm saying if there are some municipalities that are willing to sell their share, we are willing to buy. And uh, as a consequence of that, the change in the statutory, in the article of association, will, is designed to allow us to consolidate the company. But from a management point of view and from a governance point of view, uh, in the in the day by day operation, nothing will change. The only difference is on the from an accountability point of view. I, I would uh, before before the last question, I would integrate the 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 the, 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 the answer around, um, related to Toscana Energia with some numbers because I believe that could be useful for you to have some numbers of the companies. The company has a rub of around 830 million euros at the end of 17, with a, a total net financial position of 380 million. 
the ABDA uh, accounted uh, in 17 was uh, around 100 million. 60 million is the EBIT, so the EBIT rub is uh, something more than 7%, so it's a well-managed company. With a net, net income of, of 40, 40 million. Uh, as far as the, the other question, I mean, uh, as, as far as uh, the other question, the, the question on the APS evolution is concerned, it is clear that uh, with the evolution of our dividend policy, which also introduced the payout as uh, one reference in addition to the, the dividend per share growth, uh, the, uh, it is important to, uh, to, to assess the value of this option and therefore to assess the possibility of our APS to growth. Anyway, I cannot make your job. I mean, it's your job to do this calculation. I can get, just give you some reference for that. First one is uh, the uh, fact that uh, with the, the growth opportunity we have in our hands, uh, we expect, again, growth, uh, organic growth and m &A, we expect to have uh, a growth of our rub of more than 3%, the 3.2% we mentioned before, and you know that uh, without the tenders, only for the growth with, in our hands, and you know that there is a, a big correlation in our business between the uh, growth of the rub and the, uh, growth, the growth of, uh, of the operating performance of the EBIT. On top of that, you have to consider what we expect uh, to extract in, in, in order to additional efficiencies, and therefore such a 3.2% uh, is, 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 is uh, by large a floor of what we imagine to have in terms of uh, growth of EBIT. Uh, if you then consider the uh, structure of our uh, debt, again, fixed rate, um, so the fact that in terms of structure of our balance sheet, we can sustain all the growth without our debt. I would be surprised in, if, from your maths, the growth of the APS would result be lower than the growth of our EBIT. Good afternoon, Davide Reale, Union Nazionisti. I have only two fast questions. The first of all is, uh, which is the planned investment amount in order to improve directly and strictly our env environmental impact? The second one concerning page 25 about Sardinia. Has the methanization of Sardinia an important risk factor? Thank you. It's, it's difficult to extract uh, the exact amount uh, of the investment to improve and, re and to improve the sustainability and to reduce the environment impact. Because, uh, for example, uh, the fleet, uh, uh, the car fleet, it's clearly a way to reduce our footprint, environmental footprint. Uh, but there's also impact, uh, positive impact in cost. The turbo sponsor and the cogen plant that we are going to install that are present in our plants, few dozen million of euro, represent uh, a better way to use the energy and therefore being again positive for environmental impact. The, uh, uh, the replacement of the old cast iron pipes, it's a huge investment. It has a clear environmental impact positive because that we reduce significantly leaks. The investment that we are making in selecting a new way to detect leaks like Picarro Again, it's a way to reduce our environmental footprint. And I can't continue like that. The fact that in the 
refurbishment of the building for which we will spend around 20 million euro. We are designing our new building in order to be as efficient as possible. We will receive a, a certification for that. Again, it's the way to reduce the environmental peak. I have our time to find investment that has no impact on the environment. All of them have an impact. Uh, and, and some more significant, some other less. But if I look the old picture, for example, smart meters. Smart meters prevent people going around with the car in the city to read the, the meters. So instead of reading, uh, probably f making 15 million readings per year, that means that there are people are going around with the car to read, they will be read it in a remotely way. That's an environment, positive environmental impact. So I would probably say that if not all, most of our investment will have a positive impact on the environment. Regarding the Sardinia, I mean the risk that we see is the construction risk for which we are able to handle. We know exactly how to build the, the grid. Uh, the Sardinia methanization is part of the national strategy. Uh, we have recently met the, um, the president of the region, the, the chairman of the region, and he is very happy that Ital Gas has become the major player in Sardinia because he knows that what we commit to do, we are going to do it. Thank you. Sorry, we have a question here from uh, Sushita General. Hi, this is Bartekovicki, Sokgen. Uh, just the questions on digitization, a big theme of today's presentation. You're talking about 300 million of capex. Is it like a, just the beginning? You can, we can expect more going forward. Uh, you will see more opportunities. And as a result, is it also discussed and approved by the regulator? And as a result, this will increase your RAP or not? Then, if we're talking about the digitalization and smart meters, in your 1.1 million billion EBITDA assumption for 2024, how much actually comes from savings coming from smart meters, digitizations, and also how much comes from the energy efficiency services? Maybe more or less, if you can provide us with this. And the last, I might have overheard, but I think you said you don't expect the WAC to change from 2019. So what makes you believe it will not change if we assume that even only the tax, tax rate will drop from 2019? Thank you. Okay, the, let me say, 300 million is mainly devoted to the replacement of the old infrastructure with new digitized infrastructure. I make an example, so just to make it clear. We have the uh, final pressure reduction in our network that are, most of them are fully depreciated. They are, I mean, very traditional one. We are going to replace uh, in five years time all of them. And uh, they will be completely new, completely digitalized. That means that all of them will go to, into RAB. I mean, they are part of the network. I would say that probably between 90 to 95% of the 300 million will go to RAB. Probably one of the things that will not go to RAB, I mean, but will be on the centralized RAB is the control room. Uh, but everything that we are going to install on the grid, of course, on the network will be part of the RAB. Out of the uh, ABDA, you mentioned about saving on the smart meters in terms of reading. We will see, uh, we, I think we spent around, uh, if I remember well, 12, between 12 to 15 million euro per year in reading. Uh, in, the, in the period in which we have old meters and new meters, there is no saving. 
the reason being that uh, if there is uh, less cost for the smart meters, the traditional one, the reading of traditional one, because you have less to read, the, the cost per unit will increase. We will see um, reductions starting from 2021, and it would be in the range of uh, eight to eight, eight to ten percent. Will mostly depend on the cost of the data transmission. Uh, we have seen a significant reduction over the last two years. In the last two years, about the cost of the of the SIM, the cost of transmission of the data. Um, and we have made the, in our plan a further reduction. Uh, we think is going to be feasible, and that is the um, on the on the amount that we identify. That is the percentage that we are going to say about the energy efficiency is not going to be is going to be significant, but still, with uh, uh, the EBITDA is three digit, uh, the, the the energy efficiency will be two digit. So it's going to be is going to play an important part. Is not going to be the the, the core still the, the distribution activity. Well, regarding the weighted average cost of capital, well, take a look what is happening about the country spread. And if you make some maths about tax rate, your right tax rate will reduce the work. But uh, there are other elements that may work in the opposite direction. So if you make the maths, we say either, well, we are probably neutral saying that it's going to be the same. It's going to remain the same, at least for the next three years. Uh, also, okay, Mark was calling me not only the counter risk, but also the inflation is, as, as I mentioned before, is one of the elements that will be reviewed uh, at the, in, in, in the last quarter of 18. By the regulator. Hi, it's Anna Maria from Morgan Stanley. Two questions, if I may. The first one is regarding the capex. Out of uh, you have around 3.6 billion of capex, excluding uh, uh, the M&A related capex and the tenders. How much of this capex goes into the RAP? So, can we just summarize that? And the second question. So, you have a 4 billion capex plan, uh, excluding the M&A, 3.6 billion, more or less. How much of this 3.6 billion go into the RAP? And the second question is regarding the dividend policy. Uh, it's very clear to me that basically your dividend policy is set to make the shareholders benefit from the increase in earnings and is very correlated and you see value in the capex you do. But if we go to a scenario where the tenders are further delayed and the M&A opportunities are lower, would you willing to be distributing more as your business will be generating more? Um, that's the second question, thank you. Out of the four billion, uh, there are uh, in the in page. Uh, well, while uh, Marco is telling me the right page, there are 300 million devoted to centralized RAB. Centralized RAB, as you know, it is remunerated on a standard basis. So, everything else, network metering, digitization, and M&A in Sardinia will go into the RAB. On digitization, I have already answered about 95% will go to the RAP, so 5% may not go to the RAP. Um, uh, regarding dividends, well, you, we just reviewed the dividend policy. You're asking us if you are willing to review another times. But let's wait one year at least. We cannot review the dividend policy every every week. Um, having said that, I feel you got the right point that we are going to share any upside, any in a, in a sense that uh, we feel very confident that the results of the uh, of every year, especially in 2018 
will be this, the calculation of 60% will be higher than the increase of 4%. That's the reason why we propose that as a management to the board of directors and we explain to the board of directors the, the trend and the board of direction, uh, board directors approve the new dividend policy. For the new one, we need to wait at least one year. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Manuel Loza from Goldman Sachs here. Um, couple of questions, couple of follow-ups, if I may. The first one is, uh, is to Paolo. Uh, regarding the auctions, I mean, I may uh, have misread it, but um, from your previous answer, I understood that actually maybe you are not too positive or too optimistic in terms of the auctions happening in the short term, given what you were mentioning in terms of municipalities and then you may have to turn into M&A because you will see more M&A opportunities. Am I reading it correctly, just, just to confirm it? And the second one is regarding your returns. You were saying that, or you are assuming that during the, during the, um, the plan, you are assuming flat returns. Um, if we were to see further consolidation in gas distribution in Italy, do you see downside risk in terms of returns? I mean, as far as I'm, I'm concerned, you have higher returns than peers, than regulated peers in Italy, partially driven by the fact that there is very fragmented marketing gas distribution. Does it make sense to see lower returns if we see further consolidation in the sector? Thank you. You know, regarding the tenders, our view is not, uh, is what uh, we showed you before. So we, we have seen a delay and we, expect that the tender should be completed by 2023, so six years from now. It's going to be worse than that? Who knows? Unfortunately, we have been always too optimistic in the past. I think now we have come to the, to the bottom part of that situation. I don't think that is going to be worse than that. Uh, six years is a long time. So I think we have taken a, a uh, pragmatic view, I would probably say. On, on the returns on the weighted average cost of capital, uh, deconsolidation, as, as I said before, maybe I was not clear, is working exactly in the opposite way, in a sense that deconsolidation is delivering less cost for the system. I'm making an example. We acquired the Enerco last year. Uh, Enerco was getting for its uh, operations a standard of around, if I remember well, around a little bit less than 50 euro per redelivery point managed. Starting from January 1st, 2018, being an Enerco part of Italgas, we are getting 33. So there is an immediate saving of 17. So the consolidation, as I said before, not only is a missing opportunity for the investment, but is also a missing opportunity for the system to pay less. Because we are, the fact that we have a marginality, a profitability higher than the, than the other is because we have a huge economy of scale. Even though if you make the small operators be aggregated with large operators like us, there will be an immediate, I mean from time zero, saving for the system. And Enerco is an explanation. Enerco is the same. Amalfitana, the same. Uh, the one in Sicily, the same. All the small operators are getting between 45, 50, depending of the area, euro per redelivery point managed. When they become middle gas, that number goes down to 33. So we don't fear about that because we feel that we can be better than that number. So consolidation is another opportunity for the system to be more efficient in terms of cost recognition. So if the uh, one more question from the floor, then we will try to see if there are questions from the website. 
Thank you, Dario Miki Fidentis. I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is on the, the cost cutting. You mentioned two, three percent cost reduction per year over the business plan period. Uh, do you believe this is the risk the regulator may in some way uh, change uh, the rules for the X factor in the next review after 2021? And, and uh, uh, that's what's uh, your uh, assumption after 2021 in terms of X factor. And the second one is, sorry, to do that uh, is uh, on the EPS and the dividend policy. Um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, last year's payout was closer to 55% than 60%. So this year you are targeting an higher EBDA, an higher payout. So this year it should be, it ought to be uh, a first uh, scale up in terms of dividend. And then, uh, as you suggested before, I did my homework and I'm targeting around 420, 450 million euros of net profit at 2024, which means by assuming 60% payout over 2021-2024, uh, dividend uh, compound average growth rates of around 6-7% depending on the uh, final level of net profit. Is it correct or not? Thank you. Uh, regarding cost cutting, yes, I mean, we, we feel that we can achieve that number that is very close to the efficiency, is slightly better than the efficiency uh, level set by the authority. We have um, put in our plan a constant uh, efficiency target by the regulator that today is 1.7%. So. Also, after 2021, we have kept the same level. As I said before, I think the regulator, unfortunately, is not in the end of the regulator, is an incredible opportunity to reduce the distribution cost through the consolidation. If the consolidation will happen, uh, the cost reduction of term of system, from a system point of view, of the distribution cost will be much higher than than the 1.7% target every year. Uh, regarding the, I don't have the maths with me, but if you have done the right maths, uh, your number is correct. Okay, if there are no more questions from the floor, uh, let's see if there is some question from the conference call. Likes also from the conference call. No more question. Just one more question from Stefano Bezzato from the website. He's uh, trying to understand uh, what are the reasons uh, due to the decrease uh, in the uh, capital deployment uh, uh, allocated uh, to the uh, tenders uh, this, uh, in, during this, uh, cap this uh, plan period, which is 1.1 uh, rather than 1.4, which was allocated in the previous 2017-2023. The reason is very simple. We have increased the uh, m and and therefore the net is going to be less because when the tender will happen, our size in terms of perimeter will be higher because the ending point is always the same. That means that the net, so I'm not saying the gross, but I'm saying the net amount in terms of deployment is going to be less because we have anticipated the m and activity. That's the reason. And then a final question again from the web, from Alejandro Vizil from Sicinus Capital, about uh, any impact that we can see uh, from the new government recently established in terms of energy policy or uh, uh, any potential uh, uh, speed up in the tender process. Well, uh, Personal thinking, I don't, I, don't, I don't think there's going to be any impact on us, but of course the government is just uh, taking place, so it would be too early to anticipate uh, uh, a position. Uh, regarding the tenders, again, uh, we are always trying to connect uh, the delay of the tenders with political question. And, um, and Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your point of view, this is not the case. To me, uh, the delay in the tender is a missed opportunity 
for investment, local investment. It's a missed opportunity for the municipality to receive some compensation, not always in money, but also in kind. I'm taking the example what we have committed to do in, in Torino to replace the old, um, old, old eating system in the school with new, very efficient eating system. And of course, we will not be able to do it as long as we are not awarded of the tender. It's a missed opportunity for the municipality to have it in place by next winter uh, without any cost from a CAPEX point of view, but with an advantage from a consumption point of view, reducing their bill in the electricity or in gas. Uh, so, again, to me, the tenders is a missed opportunity for us, no doubt, but also for the municipality. Investment, efficiency, security, safety, all the stuff is a cost zero. And that's the reason why, to me, it's a very huge missed opportunity. Thank you. It looks like that there are two questions from the, the, the conference call. Let's see if this time uh, they are uh, showing up. Thank you. First question comes from Enrico Bartolio from Man's Main Purse. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. Um, first of all, uh, on Sardinia, um, if you can uh, give us uh, a hint of the timing with respect to uh, the CAPEX that you targeted in the plan uh, to be done, and uh, if you think uh, that uh, there could be some uh, risk uh, from uh, the, the political changes that we have uh, at the, the level of central government. You, you mentioned the support uh, from the region. Uh, I, I'm wondering what you, you're feeling about uh, the possible approach uh, by, by the government. And uh, in terms of dependence, if you can uh, provide us uh, a hint of uh, the contribution uh, to EBDA that uh, you include uh, in uh, the 1.1 billion target for EBDA in 2034, and finally, on uh, the uh, guidance that you give for your cost of debt in the, the final uh, years of the plan, uh, the 1.4, uh, uh, if you can provide us uh, um, a favor of uh, the, the level of the marginal cost of debt that you are assuming uh, for the refinancing of the bonds that have been expiring uh, starting 2022. Thank you. Uh, regarding Sardinia, we have already started, we have already assigned the first contract for uh, one, uh, one area. We will assign uh, another three in the, in the, first, in the next weeks uh, to start the construction of the new concession. The deployment of the TAPES will take place, so uh, let's say, second half of 2018-2022. That's the plan horizon, the major plan horizon about the investment. Um, regarding the risk I mentioned for us, it's more execution risk. Uh, concession are valid. I mean, it's, it's a binding uh, agreement, if you want. It's binding uh, from all the party for us, but also for the municipality. Uh, out of the capex that you have seen, uh, there is... Uh, uh, a contribution coming from the region that I think is in the range of 50 to 60 million that has been confirmed personally to me by the chairman of the pres of the of the region. Uh, they are uh, they, that amount is already in their book, so they have already allocated that amount uh, for contribution. Um, no, they tender. Ah, okay, the contribution uh, of the tenders. Uh, I think in the in the long run. No, I'll too. Okay, I will pass the floor to Antonio. That has more. There's the number in front of him. Uh, f first of all, in terms of cost of debt evolution, mm -hmm. the cost of debt evolution has been uh, 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 calculated, taking into account uh, the current uh, uh, spread 
we uh, have uh, uh, looking at the secondary market of our bonds and uh, applying uh, uh, to this spread the uh, forward rate to the moment of the, of, of the, of the maturity to be refinanced. Uh, uh, the other information is that uh, we have assumed an average maturity on this refinancing of around five years. The contribution of the tender in 2024 is between 100 and 150 million euro of the EBDA. I'm comparing, I'm just comparing, just to make it clear, I'm comparing the situation with relevant, that is relevant to the 4 billion investment. So it's the organic plus M&A with no tenders. Then I'm putting organics plus M&A plus tender. That is what we have shown to you before. The difference between the two cases in 2024 in terms of EBDA is between 100 and 150 million euro. So again, uh, the last question from uh, the uh, conference call and then we can uh, uh, stop the uh, presentation. Uh, we still have one from the floor. Uh, let's just wait f to see if uh, there is uh, the question from the conference call. No, it looks like there is no more one in the conference. So the last question from the floor and then uh, we close the session. Uh, just a clarification on, on the guidance on uh, uh, net debt to total asset below 60% by 2024. You can help us uh, clarify us uh, how uh, the payment related to the uh, expansion or the extension of the concession in Rome has been considered. If the payment that may happen in 2024 has been considered that number or not? No, we haven't considered. Okay. We haven't considered any effect. So at the end of 24, we do have the rub coming from Rome, let me say, and the, the, the debt we expect to have at the time. Many thanks. So thank you very much for coming and attending for, 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 for being uh, for being sure that I have also passed the other message is that uh, in case of the concession room is not awarded at the end, we do not have any impact on our accounts due to the fact that we did depreciation. Today we already depreciate the difference between the price set by the concession and the value of the asset in order to have at the end, in 2024, the value equal, the book value of those assets equal to the price. So we do not expect any, we do not expect, we will not have any impact on that side. The concession, just for clarification again, is expiring at the end of 2024. So next year, when we will extend the plan by one year, you will see the effect. What, what is our hypothesis is regarding from? So you should wait one year. Okay, thanks. So thanks again for coming and attending our presentation. If you need any follow-up question, any additional details, please contact the IR department. Thank you very much.